My name is Eric Escobar. Uh, I work for Securex as a penetration tester. I am the wireless technical lead, which sounds really fancy, um, and it's not. So I appreciate you all coming to the very last talk after closing ceremonies are already all over because, yeah, it shows how dedicated you really are or the fact that your flights just haven't taken off yet. So Yeah, exactly, except for watch this. I'm pretty sure I'm the only top right now, so like win, win by being the only one available, I guess. So uh, the reason that this is called Compromise from Park Bench is because it's inspired by a story of an old coworker that we had named Scott Ortel. So Scott, uh, if, if nobody knows who Scott is, I'm gonna just kind of give you some insight. Scott is like the original steampunk. He lives in an apartment and he has like a compost pile and bin on his apartment balcony. Like he is somebody that uh, takes the train from Chicago to DEF CON, right? Um, and he, well, you know, so that's like what, three, four days on a train? So Scott, Scott always likes to take public transit. Um, and for this particular pet test, it's in Chicago, and he decides, you know what, I'm not gonna drive there. Hey, Viet. Uh, so he decides, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drive, or I'm, I'm gonna take the bus to this client's site. Calls the client the week ahead of time, client's like, yeah, sure, we'll see you there, you know, sounds good, it's a wireless penetration test. Um, so he takes like this two-hour bus ride to get to the client site, which probably would have been like a 15-minute drive for him, but hey, he did it. Shows up at the client site, and it's a bank, and he walks into this bank, and he's like, hey, I'm here to do the wireless pen test. I'm here to you know, try and break in and compromise to your wireless network. And they go, sir, we don't know who you are. And he's like, well, I talked with you know, client name. And, uh, she's on vacation this week. Okay, well, can I just like test from the lobby? No, sir, you're gonna have to actually leave the building. You don't have permission to be here. Mind you, like, they paid us to do this penetration test, right? So, uh, so Scott's like, okay, like, I'll leave the building and I'll just sit in the parking lot. He doesn't have a car or anything to go, like, charge a laptop or anything, right? So, like, he's on his own and the next bus doesn't come for another four hours. Okay. And so then he sits, he's sitting in the parking lot and the security guard comes out and says, sir, you can't be on bank premises. And so they chase him across the street to a park bench. And that's what inspired this talk of just to like, yeah, compromise, you can do all of this with zero physical access from just across the street on a park bench. Uh, the other like inspiration for the talk is, if anybody's a Taylor Swift fan, there's also a, a uh, song that goes along with this. So if you know what it is, feel free to shoot, shot, shout it out, and I have a prize for the person that can figure it out. Um, what? I'm not gonna show the pictures. If you wanna see pictures of me and Taylor Swift, you can see me after, uh, I have several. Um, uh, <laughs> to go further into that context, uh, I met Taylor Swift when I was in high school, she was in high school, and then she blew up and became super famous and she does not remember me, so that's totally fine. <laughs> However, I have pictures to prove it. Pictures because it happened, right? So, anyways, there's no graphic to go along with this. That was just my story about Scott to preface, hey, you can do all of this sitting from a park bench. Um, so, okay, so these boxes that are in the picture, uh, during COVID, pre-COVID, we didn't want to travel to all of our sites, so we built these boxes. These boxes were we shipped to clients so that they plug it in, and it's just as if I'm sitting there with a laptop. Um, and when I started everything, uh, so imposter syndrome is a real thing, and I just want to, I've talked to several people that have been here, and they're like, hey, I want to get started in penetration testing, or hey, I want to get started in security, but man, you know, I work in the restaurant industry right now, or hey, I work in this industry right now, like, how do I get started? And it's one of those things that, kind of the beautiful thing, we're in the Wild West, um, you don't need a computer science degree, you don't need a degree. Um, with a couple certs and just, you know, knowing, knowing the right things to say and, you know, what certain words mean and uh, knowing how technology works and just having a curious mind, you can figure out a lot with just Google. Um, and so just to kind of put that in perspective, I started as a civil engineer and made my way to the security career path and um, they don't at all, there's no Venn diagrams. If it were a Venn diagram, it would be a bicycle, right? There's no intersection there. So um, yeah, if you're, if you're feeling like, hey, I wanna get involved in security, by all means, um, it's never too late. Um, all right, so today we're basically just gonna be talking about different types of penetration testing, but really we're gonna focus on, on wireless. The whole point of wireless penetration testing is to breach the wireless network to then get into the juicy stuff that is your internal network. Um, this, uh, this picture is basically our little mobile rig that we have, which is just a Raspberry Pi hooked up to a fat battery uh, that's 3D printed by Matt Orm over there and has our cute little Shelly logo on there that marketing doesn't like us to use. Um, also, marketing's watching this video. I love you, Natasha and Stacy. Thank you for everything. Um, <laughs> 
So uh, the best part about wireless pen testing is that it's like a decade behind all other types of penetration testing, right? Um, with like external penetration testing where you're coming in and attacking somebody from the public internet, like there's firewalls, IDS, IPS, they'll block things, like there's logs and all, all that great stuff, right? Um, for an internal penetration test, like an insider threat, okay, well like, you know, there's again, logging, ACLs, like all these protections in place, um, you know, logging, yeah, just all, all this stuff that can catch you, right? Um, with wireless penetration testing, really none of that exists. Like, if you were to attack somebody, if you were to try a password spray from the wireless network, it's going to look like it's coming from inside the building, even though I'm sitting across the street on the park bench, right? Um, and so that's that's really the fun part of this, is that Wi-Fi extends past the building. So if you're thinking of like, oh, we're a red team engagement, we're going to go, hey, Michael Ryan, back there dancing. Um, you know, if you think that, hey, you're going to do a red team test and you're going to need to like clone all these badges and sneak your way in and tear your pants uh, if you're Chris Carlos, um, you know, it's one of those things that you don't have to worry about that. You can just sit in a rented car or across the street and just capture hashes that way. And then you're not on any camera, you're not going to be fingerprinted at all. Um, and it's just like, if you can just solidly go through a wireless penetration test, uh, you can be completely undetected. Um, so, oh, I don't even know what the slide says. Let me see a second for a second. Yeah, so uh, it's easy to stay anonymous. This is like what our original like like handheld thing would have been. Just a small little battery, Raspberry Pi running, you know, Cali or whatever your flavor of Debian is, and a wireless adapter. You can stick that in a pocket and just use your phone. And so the next slide that I'm going to have, this is just me using, you know, AirDump just off of an iPhone. And I mean, if you look at me, you look at like, you know, uh, like what, uh, know what you would think a, a hacker looks like. If I just have that sitting in my pocket and I just have an iPhone, well now all of a sudden I look like any Joe Schmo sitting in your lobby waiting for an appointment, when in reality, uh, you know, I'm capturing handshakes on your networks, I'm capturing credentials, uh, and you have no idea that I'm doing that because it's all passive. Um, and so these are the things that like, I'm not, like, I'm not super smart. Like, we have geniuses on our team. I'm just clever. Like, I can just like plug things into other things and just like hopefully it works out, right? Um, and so what's nice about this is that you stick that little Raspberry Pi in your pocket, you're talking $100 off Amazon, and you can stay anonymous. Uh, and if you capture any data, you can exfiltrate it just through your pocket, right? You know, there's nothing that's going to that's gonna show up. And if it does show up, if you are logged somewhere, again, you're connected to Wi-Fi, which looks like it's coming from internal to the corporation. Also, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to like, shoot up your hand. Um, I don't want it to be like, oh, wait till the end, and you have to ask all your questions there. I'm really informal about all of this. Um, so we have several different types of clients, and I reuse a lot of images, but we walk around uh, large amusement parks from time to time trying to do wireless penetration testing, right? And so what's funny is that there's a large client of ours that uh, we walk around, we have to cover several hundred thousand acres, um, all while trying to stay out of sight. And so if you look at this backpack, you probably wouldn't really think a whole lot about that backpack, but if you look a little bit harder, uh, you can actually see that there's, what, four, five, six antennas on there that are just on the outside, right? And this is what we would walk around with and stay pretty inconspicuous, all the while we're capturing traffic on, you know, 2.4 or 5.8 gigahertz, uh, you know, capturing credentials as we walk around. And again, we're just looking at our phones. We're just normal tourists. Um, and, uh, and it's one of those things. Again, this is something that you can do with staying out of sight, staying, you know, um, staying not getting detected. Uh, there's a close-up of what's actually in there. Again, it's Raspberry Pis, which Matt Marzial hates. So uh, he's looking at me with disgust. Right Everybody now. hates them. Okay, but they're really great and they're really small, and I use them for a lot of things. I really like them, but I mean, really, yeah. Thanks, thank you back there. I mean, it's really one of those things that, like, that small computing platform, like, you can do so much with it. It's so versatile, and you can put them in a backpack. Um, yeah, but airport security doesn't know what they are, so just watch out for that. <laughs> So uh, I'll talk a little bit going down into the nitty gritty of like what wireless pen testing we do and kind of how it works. So if you think about, you know, hey, you're trying to secure a wireless network. Most of us, uh, if you have a home network, it's probably WPA2 PSK, where you just have a password, you share the password with everybody, or you know your devices on your network, and you go from there. Um, that's a really hard hash to crack. If you're ever trying to crack, you know, something wireless, something Wi-Fi, and it's WPA2, it goes like, I think, what, 10,000 times slower than, you know, standard NTLM hash, which is really, really, really slow if you're trying to crack something. Um, but there are easier ways. And again, I'm not super smart. I don't know how hashing, like, I don't know the exact algorithm or the mechanics behind it. But if I can just get somebody to give me that password, that's infinitely easier. 
Um, and so somebody stands up a rogue access point, and if you're not familiar, a rogue access point is basically just a wireless network that you, the company, or you, an individual, don't control that's trying to basically coerce your end users into connecting to it, right? Um, and so it's not hard. They sell you know, kits that are prefab online hacker warehouse that, you know, like a pineapple that do this. Um, a Raspberry Pi with just a standard wireless adapter in there, it can also create a rogue access point. And the whole end goal of this is to just coerce somebody to connect to you, and then you know everybody's used to a captive portal popping up, and who validates that that captive portal you know belongs where it should belong? Um, almost no one. And somebody that's going to submit user credentials to you is not somebody that's going to look at that either. And who would do that, right? It's one of those things that like, well, who's going to buy a ticket, or who's going to try and sit in our lobby and try and steal credentials? Um, and if you're a big enough target, you know, if you're you know, a very famous person, or if you're you know a company with anything reasonable to try and hide or try and secure, um, you know, there's a reasonable chance that somebody's just going to try and try and do this method, right? Um, and so again, this is uh, if you're going to run a tool called Wi-Fi Fisher, it does everything everything that I said, but does it super easily, and it just you know uh, push button get bacon, right? You stands up a rogue access point. It stands up, um, you know, so it looks like it clones the right network. It stands up, uh, you know, the captive portal for you. Does all the DHCP, all the networking, everything for you. And so then devices will basically say, hey, I recognize that access point. I'm going to try and connect to it because it's a stronger signal than the one that I'm, you know, than the one I normally used to connecting to. And so as as devices start to auto connect to this access point. Traffic starts going through there. Captive portals start getting you know put in front of end user devices. And somebody who's on a mobile phone that's trying to you know that's trying to just get access to the internet, they're really not going to think too hard about it. Um, and so then you'll have something like this pop up. Now, if you look at it, yeah, this is like a splash page that you know probably many of you are used to seeing on a Windows you know 10 uh, laptop. When in reality, this is all just on the website itself. This is all just you know HTML, JavaScript, or whatever. Um, so when an end user were to go type in credentials into that page, they're just going to submit that to my web page, which means it's submitted in clear text, which means I don't have to crack anything, I don't have to do anything, they just gave me the password. So I don't have to worry about like, oh gosh, how long is this you know, going to take on our cracking rig, right? I don't have to worry about any of that. They just give it to me in clear text, um, which is really nice of them. And that's where rogue access points, you can really go down the rabbit hole of like what actually matters. So everybody's... I shouldn't say everybody. Many clients, this is like the hardest thing that they have is they have no detection, they have no logging, they have no information about their wireless airspace. And so I'd say for 99% of our clients, if we go in there and do a wireless penetration test, this is always going to be a finding. They never detect that we stand up a rogue access point that looks identical to theirs. Um, and so that's like the bare minimum. If, if you are you know, the security person at your company, just have alerting, just have logging for an access point or an SSID, so like the name of your Wi-Fi, that exactly matches, you know, what what is there, because that's going to be ninety-five percent of the attacks that that come from, you know, an attacker or a threat actor that's trying to get into your wireless network, right? Um, and with that, like, I mean, there's there's stuff that's like the prosumer uh, wireless gear, like Ubiquity, that does this out of the box. And so I don't know why you have the bigger companies that run, you know, wireless infrastructure that don't just provide something easy like this out of the box, because. Think of the power of just knowing that, hey, somebody is just poking at our uh, external infrastructure. Somebody's poking at our wireless network. Just that little bit of visibility knowing that, hey, there's something kind of weird going on. Um, it's going to generate a couple hundred alerts just like that. I've, I've accidentally cloned my own AP at home, and then all of a sudden my Ubiquiti equipment sends me 300 notifications because they're like, hey, 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 there's something here. You should look at this. You should really look at this. And it's just right out of the box that it does that. Um, and so that's that's like the number one recommendation. But then you can go down this rabbit hole of you know maybe not having an exact match of the of the wireless network, or maybe you're going to randomize the MAC address, or maybe you're going to clone the same MAC address. Like we could go down this full rabbit hole of say say you have a bank with multiple branches. What happens if you went to another branch, clone that MAC address, went to the second branch, and then use that to broadcast the AP? The wireless controller would have no idea that it's a rogue access point. So there's lots of ways that you can bypass. You know, wireless intrusion prevention, wireless intrusion detection. But I, I think the heart of this is not, oh, well, there's so many different ways that you can bypass it, but that people fail at step zero. And that's even looking to see what's out there, what's available, and what's doing what. Um, let's see, what does this one say? Sorry, I can't see my slides on there. Um, yeah, so the next part of this is, uh, okay, so you have a wireless network, say you're a company. Everybody has, you know, a guest wireless network. And there's a lot of implications of guest Wi-Fi that 
that many people don't think about. Now, there's the obvious ones, right? Hey, is your guest Wi-Fi segmented from your corporate Wi-Fi? That's like one of the number one things we check for. And surprisingly, you think like, hey, you know, this is something that everybody's going to pass. But there's always exceptions. Um, the amount of times that I found a printer on the guest Wi-Fi because, hey, somebody needs to print out this patient record. Somebody needs to print out this order form, right, uh, from the guest wireless network. Well, guess what? That printer is authenticated to Active Directory. And if you can pivot through it, well, hey, now you have a set of credentials, and now you can talk to a domain controller for authentication. Bada boom, bada bing, you can use that for user enumeration and further pivoting the network. So that's the first thing. It's just, hey, if somebody's on the guest wireless network, can they talk to somebody uh, that's on the corporate network? That's the first thing to look at if, if you know, this is something that, that, again, you're concerned with. The next thing, though, that, that is often not covered is, do your, are your devices isolated from one another? So if me and Wole are on the same wireless network, can my device talk to his device? And if so, what are the implications of that? So many people think like, hey, guest Wi-Fi, it's the Wild West. We don't really care. People use the guest. We have that little captive portal thing that pops up that says, oh, you know what? We're not that worried about it because ah, it's just iPhones. It's just people trying to get internet access, no sweat. Um, where that falls down is what happens the first time Corp Wi-Fi is down. Say no users can connect to Corp Wi-Fi. What happens? Well, everybody hops onto the guest Wi-Fi. Well, now all of a sudden, that means that all of your devices, you know, for your corporation, have now migrated over to the guest Wi-Fi, where there's no protections, where there's open access, and anybody can interact with those laptops. So on more than one occasion, what I've done is walked up, said, oh, there's a lot of devices on Corp Wi-Fi, and there's no devices on guest Wi-Fi. Let me just nuke and kick everybody off of corporate Wi-Fi. They hop over to guest Wi-Fi. Now I can interact with laptops, and I can run tools like Responder, all your normal NetPen tools that are going to get you hashes. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. And so we got a whole bunch of hashes, cracked a whole bunch of passwords, and then I instantly made the you know corp Wi-Fi stop deauthing it, and so everybody reconnected to it. But it didn't matter because at that point I already had a domain admin credential that then I could use for whatever I wanted to going forward, right? Um, or in that in that same time, you could pivot into another host if there's like SMB signing not enabled, or I can reuse that credential. And then if I have a beacon on that, say say I have a beacon, so say say I have a I'm not gonna say beacon because that's uh, too deep, but like say say I was able to compromise a laptop that while it was on the guest Wi-Fi. Well, now the second that that laptop is on the guest Wi-Fi and then it's compromised. If all of a sudden now it reconnects you know, back to the normal corporate Wi-Fi, great, I've Trojan horsed my way into that corporate network, and it doesn't matter if there's certificate signing, it doesn't matter if they're using you know, a 30 character long password. If I was able to compromise that device and now it's on your corporate Wi-Fi, now, I've, now I have basically full C2 control over that, you know, over that device and potentially that network. And we, we've used that method you know, a handful of times to gain access to a network that was otherwise fully secure where, hey, in order to connect to this corporate network, you needed certificates, you needed strong user credentials, you needed it to come from a proper device. Um, and again, it's one of these things that uh, I have the easy job of, I only need to find one way to attack a computer on your network. Whereas if you're a defender, you have to find all the ways that somebody's potentially gonna do it. And you have to also be you know, accountable to stakeholders that want an easy you know, end user experience, right? Because not everybody's a techno nerd like, like us, right? I thought somebody raised their hand, but Nate was just stretching. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, other implications of guest Wi-Fi, because again, it's one of those things that everybody's like, yeah, we just host guest Wi-Fi, like, so what? What's the worst that could happen? Um, we're gonna talk about egress IPs. So we have clients that uh, they have a perfectly separated corporate, uh, corporate network from their guest network. So what that means is that I can't talk to any devices that are on the guest network, so they're all isolated from each other. I can't talk to anything on the corporate network. Awesome, super good job. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of the times, uh, the public IP address that that corporation uses, the egress IP, the internet service that they use, is the same public IP address, just you know, on a segmented network. And so if you were, you know, if you were on the corporate network and you were to say, what's my IP address? It would be the same if you were on the guest network and said, what's my IP address? As far as the public internet is concerned, they see the same exact public IP address. Well, one of the things with everything moving to the cloud is that, yeah, everybody has, or we, we'd like to see companies have multi-factor authentication everywhere. So you get your Office 365, you log in, username, password, and then, hey, you get prompted for multi-factor authentication. But at some point, you know, user usability comes into play here, and they say, hey, you know what? Look, we require badges, we require access, we have cameras to get into the building. Let's just assume that if they're in the building and they're using valid credentials, 
then guess what? We're just going to let these users go by without using multi-factor authentication. If you're in the office, we don't need any use for multi-factor authentication um, on something like Office 365. Well, the problem with that is the way that you enable that is by saying, hey, uh, Microsoft Azure, Office 365, there's a trusted IP address. And that trusted IP address, we're not going to require multi-factor authentication. But if you hop on the guest network, you have the same public IP address. So now all of a sudden, you can log into somebody's Office 365 with zero multi-factor authentication, and then you can do everything that would then go from an external penetration test, from an internal penetration test, all of your other typical ways of penetration testing. But you've bypassed multi-factor authentication. And again, everybody, you know, I mean, maybe not everybody, but a common thing is like, dude, who is going to go show up to your organization? Who's going to go show up to your branch? Who's going to go buy a plane ticket and use this to you know, compromise your company? And it's like, sure, you know, it, it's definitely a threat. You know, it may not be the first thing on anybody's priority list, but think if you're a large chain. Think if you're a large chain restaurant. Think if you're a large chain retailer. Well, now all of a sudden, you know, you probably, if there's an attacker in your city that wants to do this, they don't have to go very far. It might just be a grocery trip for them, where they can then use this to their advantage to then compromise the whole rest of the organization. Um, so again, you know, is this gloom and doom? Absolutely not. But it's just something to consider when you're giving public access and you're giving you know, wireless access that extends beyond you know, your typical brick and mortar walls. Does anybody have any questions with that? Did anybody find the Taylor Swift song? All right. Before we move on to secondary egress, um, question for you. Is there a justification using that um, with some of the web scoring services that are out there? So if you, if you, if you uh, look at my egress, for my company, and you look at the scoring engines that are out there to see if that data is being divided or not. Do you ever, do you ever look into that? I mean, the the problem with the problem that I see, and maybe, again, I know not a whole lot of things, but the problem that I see with that is. Uh, you like if you are the system administrator, you're the one that's already allowing the IP address, and so you just be checking the reputation of your own IP address. And really, um, I mean, you could see that, but there's not going to be a way for you to potentially differentiate. Hey, is this a threat actor that's coming from inside our corporate network, like maybe just the, the you know malicious employee versus somebody on the guest Wi-Fi? Because as far as you can see, it's only coming from your public IP address. Does that answer it? Okay, cool. Um, so the other thing that I'm going to, oh. Uh, you belong with me, is that the song? Well done. Well done, I have a prize for you at the end of this. Everybody give him a round of applause. <laughs> Sitting on a park bench, thank does you. Does that mean we can't guess anymore on the songs? Uh, you can keep guessing on the songs. Cool. Great, yeah. yeah. He has to sing it now. <laughs> what was that? He has to sing it now. Oh yeah, if somebody wants to sing it, that's another prize. <laughs> Um, so, okay, say somebody has an uber secure network. There's no way you're getting in. They don't have guest Wi-Fi. Everything is certificates. Everything is as good as it can be. There's still more fun that can be had. So if you look at the screen, this is a screen from one of the tools that we mainly use called AeroDump, right? Um, and really, there's a whole just a bunch of weird numbers. And those weird numbers and symbols are MAC addresses. So that's the hardware address of that device that's connecting to the wireless network. Now, this is always in plain text, because this is what has to be used for devices to know negotiate who hey, who is this device on the network? This is how you know, the base thing that, that Wi-Fi uses to communicate device to device. Um, and so I can see on the left side and on the right side, the, the station, well, no, do I have that right? Um, yeah, so the station on the right is like a client device. So you can think, hey, maybe this is my Nest thermostat. Maybe this is my Wise camera, right? Um, and on the left-hand side, that is the wireless access point that it's connecting to. Well, it's interesting about this, again, all this information is in clear text, and you're probably thinking, Eric, that this is useless to pretty much anybody because it's just random numbers. What information could that give you? And so if you were to see this, so this is just a bigger view of it. So if you were to take that MAC address, each hardware manufacturer has a MAC address that's registered to them when they're manufacturing devices. Um, that way there's not, you know, it's, it's supposed to prevent, like, you know, uh, duplicate MAC addresses from duplicate, um, you know, manufacturers, right? But I can see, hey, just based upon that, that address right there, that MAC address, even though I have no information about the wireless network, even though I can't compromise the security at all, I can still see that they're running an S thermostat. And what's interesting about that is that, say I find out that you're running you know, some Wise devices, some Google Nest devices, some Alexa, some, you know, all these smart home things, right? 
Well, they have other wireless connectivity in there. They have Bluetooth, they have NFC, they have Aura, they have all this other technology that's on there. And so now I know what's in your house without ever having compromised the wireless security just because of what they're beaconing, just because of their IDs that they're beaconing. And so if there's potentially some other vulnerability that gets disclosed about any of those devices on any other different protocol, well, now you have another vector or another way into this you know, user's network. Plus, you have a bunch of information about them, right? And it doesn't have to be an end user or a house. It could also be a building. You could know that this building is using ring security or sentry safe, or maybe they're using mats and alarm. And you can know that based upon just the hardware information that's beaconed out completely in clear text. Um, what is this thing? Yeah, so uh, what's, I figure what the adage is, you know, something can be simple, but it's not easy to do, right? So it's really easy for me to get up here and be like, yeah, everybody, you should do this. You should secure your networks this way. But having been on the other side of it, it's way, way, way harder to put this into practice. And I sympathize with that, right? I sympathize that every single time I run a penetration test, that again, I only have to find the easy way in. I don't have to, you know, block all the holes. Or one of the other things that frequently comes up is, hey, if we were to patch this, if we were to upgrade from Windows XP to you know, Windows 10, all of a sudden, well, now that's not gonna work with all of this hardware that we have. So I'm sympathetic to, to all of that stuff. And so, so don't take this whole presentation to being like, oh yeah, wow, everybody's doing wireless security terribly, because there's a lot of other things that come into play. I mean, we test hospitals all the time. And the amount of times that we find a, a wireless network that's running WEP is you know, frequently quite frequent. And that's completely broken protocol that, you know, in about seven minutes you can fully compromise. But you now you think, hey, this isn't a hospital and there's insulin pumps using WEP that are connected to this wireless network. That's terrifying. And so you, it's easy for me to say, well, just upgrade to WPA2. And then you realize, oh, well, the vendor went out of business. And so there's no more firmware, you know, upgrades available. Or to upgrade to that is going to mean, you know, a $10 million rollout of all these new insulin pumps that they've already invested money in. So, so it's not an easy fix for anything um, by any means. And it's simple for me to be up here and just to say, ah, do it right, you know, don't do it wrong. Um, there's a lot of considerations that have to be taken. Um, yeah, so understand what information you're beginning out. Um, log your data, have logs available. The amount of times that uh, we run a penetration test and they're like, oh, well, we saw your rogue access point. And I was like, okay, can you just give me some log information so I can include that in the report? And then I never hear anything back. And then I give them the report and it's like, log your data. You know, know what wireless access points are out there. Um, and again, it comes stock on, on many common platforms. So just, just Google it. Yeah, anyways, questions, comments? Wanna hear Joe? Kali or just or just Raspbian. Yeah, Kali typically has like the better libraries, like everything like kind of works with it. You just app get install. Um, but you know, when you install Kali, it's like, oh great, you get everything in the kitchen sink installed on there. Um, and if you just want to keep it leaner, you can run just Raspbian. Um, I don't do anything. Like again, like I'm not gonna like build my own custom pen to thing. I'm not that smart, so. Yeah, I use it for like some of our uh, captive portal like little devices. Um, it's yeah, I mean like I use it sometimes, not not all the time though. Any other questions? Anybody want to sing a song? Michael Aguilar, raise your hand. No. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you everybody.